We are now guests at uh, Professor Roger Cottrell's home here in northern part of London. And uh, I would like to start asking you, could you say something about your academic background? Yeah. Um, well, my current position is, uh, has the great name of the Anniversary Chair of Legal Theory at Queen Mary University of London. So I, I guess I'm a legal theorist, really, but I always interpret that as being, as meaning now a socio-legal yeah. theorist, not a legal philosopher. I never think of myself as a legal philosopher. And I started out in straight law. I did a law degree, a postgraduate law degree at London University, and uh, I wasn't quite sure why I did it. My father thought, you know, it would be a good thing to be a, a lawyer, and I hadn't got any idea what I wanted to do in my he life. Wasn't, he wasn't a lawyer himself. He wasn't a lawyer, he was okay. an engineer, but he thought it would be a good profession, so I did law, and um, didn't really excite me very much until the final year of undergraduate studies, and I did a course in legal theory. All British London law students had to do a compulsory course okay. in what we call jurisprudence, legal theory. And I thought that was good because it kind of opened things out and it made me feel that it might be acceptable to read social science, to read philosophy, to read interesting things like Scandinavian realist writers and so on. I got into that and did a lot of reading and for the first time it became interesting. And when I did postgraduate law studies I followed that up and I started to teach law Leicester University, but I very quickly felt that I was still trapped somehow. I was teaching law to law students. The legal profession really uh, was kind of driving everything. What you needed to teach was basically what would be useful in practice as a lawyer or what would be the kind of intellect, to create the kind of intellectual background that a good lawyer should have. And I thought it was too, I thought it was too narrow because I began to feel, I read something by Oliver Wendell Holmes that said that a law is a great anthropological document. You could study the whole of human life through law if you do it the right way. And I sort of felt there was something lacking. And then I got a job in London, Queen Mary College, and the year following that I discovered I could do a postgraduate sociology degree at the same time as teaching, continuing to teach law. So during the day, full time I was teaching law students, and at night I was going to evening classes to learn Sociology and, and you did that on your own initiative? Yeah, so? over two years okay. I, did, I did. And what does sociology of law mean for you today? Um, it's, it's the way of thinking about law that makes law come alive as an intellectual field. It, it makes it, law seem important. It means that it, by, by approaching things through, through sociology of law you can see that all the time law has to be doing something in society. If it isn't doing any, anything in society, why bother with it? You know, it, it's not just rules, it's not just words in textbooks or statutes. It, it has to be something that shapes life, something that makes a difference in people's life. So what is it? It's the, um, it's the study of uh, the practices, institutions, experiences and ideas of law from a sociological perspective, that's the way I see it. And, you do? Uh, and, you know, and in terms of legal research, I've said this in print, I think that socio-legal studies, as we often call it, I, I don't really see a difference between sociology of law and socio-legal studies. Socio-legal studies is the most important kind of research that's being done about law now. Uh, a classical problem in uh, sociology of law is uh, uh, what you, Roscoe Pound, uh, labor as uh, law in books and law in action, the so-called gap problem. Is that something which has occupied you? Or? <clears throat> no, not, a, not at all, I think I have to say. Um, I don't think about sociology of law, I don't think about law in those terms. And I actually think it's an outdated way of looking at uh, law's social significance. Um, for this reason, when we talk about the gap problem, I and mean, this was a very important way of thinking in sociology of law for a long time, and I think what it presupposed was that law is here, society is here, sociology of law is the study of law and society, and the problem that is set up is that 
these two things, law and society, are somehow separate. Law is not part of society. It's something separate from society. And then the question becomes, how does this relate to this? How does it, into, you know, how does it act on society? How does law act on society? And so I don't think that's the right way of looking at things. It, it, it's assuming that law itself is not a social thing. Law has to be related to society, so law, law itself is not a social thing. It's as though law is a kind of technique which somehow has to achieve some effects on society. So the, the thinking in terms of the gap problem led to um, impact studies, for example, what we used to call impact studies, how law impacts on society. But I don't think there's any single way in which law relates to society because there are a lot of different kinds of law and, the, and society consists of a lot of different kinds of social life. It's an extremely complex question to say how law relates to social life. And I think of um, the law as a social phenomenon as being an aspect of society or a field of social life, not something separate from social life. So <clears throat> I tend to think in a different way of law as being something that is created within communities or within networks of community. And law is an expression of the regulatory problems, regulatory needs of communities, networks of community. Um, so law is actually integrated in social life. right? But then you might say, well, that's not the way it looks to me. I, I see the state producing rules you know, and imposing them on social life. Well, the state is a great big network of community or networks of community. And the nation state is a, is a network like that. And, the, and state law is the expression of the regulatory needs of that network of community. Um, and that forms the basis for a central sociology of law. Yeah. According to your own writing, when you today criticize the, the narrowness of, of sociology of law when it comes to transnationalism. That's right. How about social media? Sorry to interrupt social, you. Roger. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think this is a very important extension of that, in a way, social media, because um, social media make possible networks of community in new ways. I don't know whether they're very deep-rooted, uh, ultimately very powerful. They might be very transient and limited, but they are significant for sure. But I wanted to have an idea of community that um, would not be like uh, Ferdinand Turney's old idea of Gemeinschaft, not like the, the warm village community or the local community that is kind of smothering and repressive in a way and, and all-embracing. Uh, a contract, con contractual relationship is a relationship of community. Um, a, a, a friendship, a relationship of friends is a relationship of community. The believers in a religion form a community which could well cross national borders. Um, and people who have an adherence to a particular language, you know, also form relations of community. Or they might be simply linked in relations of community because they live in the same place. Uh, the local community that sociologists have often talked about. So I, I like the idea of community as long as you recognize that there are several fundamentally different types of community and law is going to relate to those types in different ways. Won't be the same relationship. But I mean, one, one way of understanding this external and internal would be to uh, uh, say that law uh, is reproduced uh, and generated, self-generated in a kind of internal perspective, right. while society stands for the uh, external influencing, uh, communicated with law, depending on what kind of theoretical perspective yeah. you yeah. have. Yeah, I think you perhaps... Uh, Thinking in terms of Lumen, for a instance, bit, and typical, very typical, I guess. Yeah. Teubner and Lumen. Sure. That's yeah. very powerful, but ultimately, I don't agree with it. Mm. I don't think law forms a separate system of communication because I think law is a very porous thing. It, 
legal thinking, legal reasoning, always draws on what some people would say are non-legal ideas. Lumen, of course, talks about cognitive openness of law as a, as a communication system, but it's more than that. It's also normatively open as well. Uh, it, it, law is continually shifting its judgments, not just through um, applying uh, this legal, non-legal binary code. It's uh, developing its judgments by relating to the changing conditions of life. And I see judges, for example, in court, um, in a way almost desperately trying to make sense of the outside world and draw their understanding of what's going on in the outside world into their development of the law. M maybe this is particularly the case with the common law system, you know, but I certainly see that, that going on. Laws embedded in society, it's not a separate system of, of communication. Also, the, uh, another point to make is that um, in any given legal system, I think there are actually several perhaps contradictory uh, systems of communication going on. You know, it, again, in the common law system, um, administrators might be understanding a certain area of law in one way, where courts are understanding it in a different way. And unless something gets appealed through the court system so that the courts give a final, ultimate re ruling, you may have a huge range of uncertainties in the law which are interpreted in different ways in different parts of the state. Yeah. So I find it difficult to see law as a communication system. It's, uh, it's a lot of different methods and mechanisms of regulation which have many different complex relationships with their social settings. Mm. But if, if we uh, turn more into uh, the article you have uh, articles you have written about uh, transnational communities yeah. and, and uh, uh, legal transnationalism uh, one of your points there is that uh, uh, sociology of law has to uh, uh, let's say reshape and reformulate uh, uh, both law and society yeah. in order to be able to cope with these transnationalism yeah. and, and these transnational problems. Yeah. Uh, how would that uh, fit into what we have said so yeah. far? I think it's a, a, a growing problem for sociology of law. Um, sociology of law has been built on, it's been assumed that the Sociology of law is the study of law in society, or I would prefer to say law in society. And the assumption has been that we know what law is, yeah. and we roughly, we know what society is. We know what law is, it's the law of the nation state. And we know what society is, basically it's political, the political society is the nation state. The nation state. And that's where we start yeah. from. So that's really formed the agenda for sociology of law. How does the state regulate society? Mm. But if you look at what's happening transnationally, for example, first of all to law, what's happening transnationally, what you see is a great chaotic pluralism, pluralistic range of regulatory regimes, nation state law, international law, uh, laws and regulations produced by international bodies, European Union law, uh, international commercial arbitration producing norms, standard setting by innumerable transnational bodies, internet law being produced, well you might not want to call it law, but let's say internet regulation being produced by the technical experts and groups Co code as law, as law as Exactly, you know, it, yeah. running code, that yeah. sort of idea. It's being produced in, in that way. Go further still um, and take some ideas, say, from Francis Snyder or Paul Schiff Berman, people like that. Global legal pluralism they talk about. What does that mean? It means all of these different things I've been talking about, different kinds of law and regulation, plus lots of regulation that's produced bottom-up by within 
transnational industries, by transnational corporations, by networks of economic actors, networks of human rights actors, uh, transnational religious communities, like, you know, Muslim communities in many different countries who are kind of thinking about Sharia law and what it means today and so on. So you've got an immense range of things which law can now be taken to mean because law has spilled out beyond the nation state, you know, it's no longer contained within the nation state. And um, even the old way of thinking about international law, of course, was that international law got its validity because it was approved by the nation states who treated it as their consensus, you know. Everything used to focus on the nation state, no, now it no longer does. So law itself has become kind of, it's lost its anchors. Yeah. It's become very, very indeterminate what it is. Now look at the society side. What's happened to society? Well, I've already mentioned international commercial, transnational commercial communities, you know, who are busy creating their own regulation in commerce. We talk about the new Lex Mercatoria, the new merchant law, hugely important. Um, and in a host of ways, laws being produced outside national borders. Or you've got nation state law as well, which is intended maybe to operate extraterritorially to some extent, some, you know, some American legislation. The concept of society no longer would carry the weight that had been put on it in, in sociology of law before. We needed a new way of thinking. And I like, I, I like the concept of community, community because it suggests, if you talk about community, you immediately have to go on to explain what the bonds are that link people in community. Whereas when we used to talk about law and society, we would never used to have to think about the bonds that held people together in society. We just assumed, you know, Sweden is a, society, yeah. Britain is a society, you don't need to say anymore. But if you think in terms of community, you've got to ask, what are the specific kinds of links yeah. that hold people together? Are they instrumental? <coughs> are they based on beliefs or ultimate values? Are they based on emotion yeah. and effect? Are they based on custom tradition? So I, I thought, in what's really happening to sociology of law is that it's two great pillars. The two great pillars holding it up are both crumbling. Most contractual regulation still needs some kind of coercive ultimate support. The re interesting question for us as legal sociologists is where do we find that ultimate coercive support? You know, If we can't find it in nation states, we need to find it somewhere else. And I think that's you, still an you, open question. Yeah, you, you use uh, uh, both in these articles and, and uh, in your earlier writing the concepts of uh, voluntas and, and ratio. Yeah. Uh, and uh, voluntas then stands for the coercive power and, right. and ratio for the more, let's say, discursive uh, yeah. creation of, of principles. Yeah. Uh, would that be a kind of transition we are touching on yes. in this discussion that we are leaving uh, voluntas in favor of ratio? Or? Yeah, precisely. You can't leave voluntas out because in my view all law has to have... That is what you say, that still it has to be there in the background. You have to have both voluntas yeah. and ratio. Um, voluntas is coercive authority and ratio is the principle and reason of the, of the law. So. If you take the contract, for example, yeah. the, the, most of the regulation that a contract provides is ratio. It's the reasoned, it's the terms of the contract, the reasoned terms, principles, agreed ideas of the contract. That's, and, you know, Stuart Macaulay has you know, famously studied um, contractual relations and found that in many, many cases the state wasn't needed to intervene. The, the ratio, the... the, the uh, terms of the contract were enough to produce order. Um, but I think for all networks of community that produce regulation, there has to be both a voluntas and a ratio element if we're going to be able to observe law. The challenge for legal regulation uh, uh, is uh, to recognize uh, 
uh, both the uh, different kinds of variables uh, uh, that unite and differentiate uh, uh, people. That's one of your points uh, uh, in relation to this. And uh, uh, you also uh, talk about uh, EU uh, in this context. Uh, context uh, uh, and uh, let me quote what you say in your article uh, uh, before uh, having a comment from you. You say, for, in, uh, for example, the European Union has provided a, 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 a suburb uh, a laboratory for exploring not only aspects of transnational regulation, but the soci uh, sociological character of the Europe uh, that constitutes the social setting. Uh, what, uh, uh, how would you, uh, let's say, comment on, on, on this. Is European Union uh, uh, a step in, in a, a direction of, uh, let's say, being more, uh, less dependent on, on, on the state and the voluntas for regulation? Or is it the same but just on, on another level? It's upgraded. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the same problem upgraded. It's a, there's, uh, we know there are very serious problems about the acceptability of European Union law in various contexts. And of course, uh, the standard way of talking about that is the famous democratic deficit, no demos argument. But I, I'd like to think about it in a different way. Um, and it, it's a way that goes right back to the beginnings of sociology of law with Eugen Ehrlich. Uh, um, Ehrlich's idea of living law, law close to the people, law rooted in communities and associations, okay. And confronting that is the law of the nation state or the law of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, whatever it is, right up here, a long, long way away from the people. And so I, that problem of distance, you know, I call it a problem of moral distance, the moral distance of regulation from the people it regulates. That's an enduring problem for nation states. How does the state communicate with the people? I actually think democracy is only one means of doing that. There are other means of this for the state to get the information it needs to regulate. And Emil Durkheim had a lot of interesting things to say about that. If you look at the EU context, the problem is vastly greater, plainly. How on earth do the institutions of the European Union understand Europe? You know. What do we do about that? I don't have any answers to that, except that I think the law and community approach that I use really highlights the problem. You think of, think of um, regulation developing within networks of community, then think of the state as a big network of community or a network of networks, if you like, of community, incredibly complex range of social relations, which somehow the state, through its law, tries to coordinate, you know. So I think, I think nation-state law, you can see basically, is coordinating law to a large extent. And that's when it works best, when it tries to coordinate regulation rather than trying to impose top-down direct regulation on, on the citizens. So what does the European Union do through its law? Um, it issues directives, it sort of tells member states often how to change their law to um, regulate differently. The huge problem for the EU is to get the information it needs to be able to do that in an intelligent way. So, you know, the, the European Union, if you think of Europe as the network of community that gives legitimacy to EU law, it's like a network of network of networks, isn't it? It's so incredibly complex and so varied. And I think that I don't really see democracy in Europe, you know, European Union democracy or European Union citizenship as a solution to that problem. What I think is involved is <coughs> recognizing that uh, reg the creation of regulation always has to be a kind of negotiation between top down and bottom up. It will only work if, if, it's, if it has an input from the experience of communities, networks of community, 
their, their experience of life feeds into the regulation that makes sense to them. And at the same time, wise regulators try to get as much information as they can and produce norms, rules to regulate. So it, it's probably impossible to do that at the EU level, at the, the level of the whole thing. What you need are lots and lots of levels in which that's going on. But why do you talk about a, a moral distance? Because plainly we're not talking about geographical distance necessarily, although you know, when Ehrlich wrote Chernovitz where he worked was thousand, I don't know, many thousands of miles from Vienna where the r rules were produced. But essentially it's not a geographical issue. It's a moral issue because <laughs> where there's too much distance between the regulator and the regulated, it's a kind of, it's unfair, it's a moral fraud almost. The regulator is telling the regulated what they must do in ignorance of the conditions of life of the regulated. And uh, the regulated population cannot really tell the regulator adequately what things are like for them, what life is like for them. So it's a moral distance, it's a moral problem. And um, actually within legal philosophy, Lon Fuller was the, the writer who most who was most aware of that issue. You know, Fuller wrote about um, fidelity to law and a sort of reciprocal relationship between the legislator and the citizen. Um, the citizen gives allegiance to the, reg the leg legislator, but in return, the legislator must somehow respect the citizen. Maybe the phrase moral distance is a bit unhelpful. I can see it could be misunderstood. I mean, it's not the content of the law I'm talking about, it's the way of creating law that's, that in a sense you could say is immoral. It's a bad way of creating law because it's an ignorant way of creating law. The, the regulator is too far away from the regulated. It may be that the content of the law is, is morally very noble, you know. I mean, I think a lot of European Union law, for example, is extremely well motivated, you know, the things like um, the sort of human rights law that's developing under the umbrella of the European Union and so on is, mm. for me, is a, is a good thing. And the European Union law is trying to build, I hope, trying to build an integrated, cohesive Europe in one way or another. So it, it's certainly not that law lacks moral content. We might disagree about the moral content, whether we think it's good or bad. But I think actually there's very little law that has no moral significance one way or another, for either for good or bad. And Durkheim insisted over and over again that um, law which doesn't have a moral content is law that has lost its soul. It's just words on paper, barren words on paper. And I think that's right. Mm. And there might be a relation between uh, your criticism of the instrumentalist yeah. uh, way of looking at these things yeah. and the moral sure. aspects, I yeah, guess. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> to talk uh, uh, very strongly, you're critical against what you <laughs> label as a kind of Bermuda triangle, which is uh, yeah. blocking sociology of law from... Yeah let's right. say, liberalizing itself uh, 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 for a more genuine pluralist uh, yeah. approach. Yeah. Uh, how you, uh, and that is, uh, uh, we, we mentioned the instrumental uh, way of looking at law, which you, you criticize, but you uh, also uh, uh, criticize uh, so, uh, law and sociology for uh, this uh, interest analysis and mm. the converging mm. uh, theories. Mm. Could you say something about that? All what? three? All three of them? Yeah. Okay. Um, legal instrumentalism, this idea, it's not my term. I mean, Brian Tamanar uses yeah. it a lot in his nice little book called um, There's a Law as a Means to an End. Uh, the idea is that Legal instrumentalism is the idea that law is a tool, an instrument, yeah. for getting things done. Uh, so it's like, you know, you, you take a hammer off the shelf. What is the hammer for? It's so you can knock a nail in. 
the hammer is an instrument, a means to an end. Law is like that, according to legal instrumentalism. It's a neutral thing. It's a, a tool you can pick up and use. So government, plainly, uses this tool to regulate the nation's nation, po national population or whatever it is. Uh, it's a tool of government in this view. Also, it's uh, a means that litigants can use. So in a legal instrumentalist view, a citizen thinks whether they can turn the law to their own purposes. You know, can I go and see my lawyer, get advice and win my case? I don't, I don't necessarily care what the values of the law are or what it's for in some social, large social purpose. I don't care about that. I just care about my case. Will I win my case? You know, is the law going to get me to where I want to be? That's legal instrumentalism. And in terms of sociology of law, I think legal instrumentalism has been the basic idea of law that's underpinned sociology of law right up until the recent past. Uh, we know that sociology of law developed very much because European states and the United States and so on, the Western states, wanted to find out how to use law more effectively for various purposes, how to build welfare states, how to uh, solve problems of race relations, how to produce gen gender equality, how to deal with the problems of poverty, you know. And, and the sociologists of law joined in to help to make law work better. Fine as far as it goes, but unfortunately it's a hostage to, it's a hostage to fortune because when, when um, the state gradually stops being the centre of attention for one reason or another, the bottom falls out of this, you know, the, the, the whole assumption on which it's been based becomes un, unsteady. Uh, several ways in which that's happened. One is that, of course, Western, Western states have lost faith in using law. Convergence theory, that's a different set of problems. I'm extremely hostile to convergence theory. <laughs> Why? Because... Um, Convergence theory suggests that we're all on the same track. If we look into the future, we'll find that eventually we're all going to get to the same point. Classic case is Francis Fukuyama's End of History. Eventually we're all going to be Western liberals, one way or another, wherever we've come from, you know. But how about your own, let's say, program, your own solution? You have some ideas. Uh, about possible changes in the future for for sociology of law. Yeah, <coughs> um, tell us something about. I that. would like to. Uh, I think two things. I'd like to see sociolo sociology of law um, develop its thinking about legal transnationalism much more than it has done so far. Although there are a lot of writers who are contributing to this, we don't have adequate theory to use in this area. We're still working with the old theories that we've inherited, the old theories of law, which relate to the nation state, the old theories of society, which relate to the national political society. We do need to go beyond that. And that's a huge project for, you know, extremely ambitious people in the future. That's, that's one thing. We spent too long, I think, trapped in instrumentalist thinking. We need to examine our idea of law a bit more. Instead of assuming that law is like the hammer, the, we're not very interested in hammers as such. We're only interested in what hammers will do. We're not terribly interested as sociologists of law in what law is. We're interested in what law does. But we should be more interested in the nature of law in legal ideas. We should develop the sociology of legal ideas alongside the sociology of behaviour, which is hugely developed, of course, in sociology of law. We should focus also on sociology of legal ideas. Why should we do that? Well, I said at the beginning that I come out of law, jurisprudence. I still teach in a law school. I would like sociology of law to invade the law schools, to invade the jurists' world shake up 
the jurist world, shake up the complacencies of lawyers. And it can only do that if it focuses on legal ideas and analyzes them in a different way from the way that lawyers do. So a, for, for a lot of its history, sociology of law has run in parallel with juristic thought. It's kept, it's kept its separate territory. Kelson said that, you know, they're two different things, sociology of law and legal theory. From the sociologist's point of view, Donald Black says the thing, same thing. Gov law is governmental social control. Law is not ideas, says Donald Black. You know, I disagree. I think that uh, sociology of law should include the sociology of legal ideas. So that, that, that involves um, asking why uh, legal problems are, tend to be solved in certain ways. Why do lawyers come up with certain kinds of arguments? Why does law move in one direction rather than another? Jurists, lawyers will give you answers to that. But I actually think sociologists can give answers as well. And maybe better answers in the end. So we should take on, you know, sociologists of law should not be satisfied to stay in their own realm, separate, from the law school world, uh, they, they should engage also with jurist arguments in one way or another. I'm, I mean, I have some special reasons for saying that. I just find contemporary, especially contemporary Anglo-American legal philosophy, so limited now, so tied to the same old debates, natural law and positivism inclusive legal positivism, exclusive legal positivism. And a lot of people are really not terribly interested in those issues now. But they are interested in where law is going. They are interested in how law is becoming transnational. They are interested in how different ethnic communities, for example, in nation states, have different aspirations for law, multiculturalism. It's a huge issue for all of us now, you know. They're interested in things like that, socio-legal questions, yeah. and so... Um, but perhaps uh, sociologists of law has to, or legal sociologists, have to bring perhaps new concepts from sociology into the uh, legal understanding of the legal issues. I would like to hear if you have any comment on, for, for instance, broaden law to uh, incorporate norms in general or be a part of, right. of, 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 of a, norm, a, a wider norm concept and, and in that way <coughs> uh, uh, free itself from the burden of, of, of being connected to the nation state and all these things. Yes, yeah. right. I, I agree with that. I think that's, that's very important. Uh, a lot of the work on transnational private law or is very point. much concerned with norms, yeah. sure, and it sees um, something like legal regulation growing up through the formation of social norms yeah. and their, the institutionalization, as I would call it, of social norms. Yeah, it's very, very important. Also, of course, uh, as we know, the, the tradition of sociology of law, right, going right back to the beginning, yeah. the study of norms has been crucial. But you came, as you have mentioned. Durkheim and, and Ehrlich, Eugen yeah. Ehrlich's living law, the study of norms within social associations. Yeah. And I know that you know. Part, I know your work on on norms, and of course in Sweden there's a there's a tradition, isn't there, which goes back to Segerstedt. I will pronounce his name wrongly. Tony Segerstedt. Tony Segerstedt. Yeah, yeah. He, he wrote, he wrote about, about, 48 about these things. Customs and codes, and the general sense of justice in the community in yeah. the Swedish society. Uh, studying social norms as the building block for regulation which either becomes law or becomes significant for for law. And I'm also thinking of um, something like André Jean Arnaud's yeah. idea of what he calls the avant dire droit, um, rules that are on the way to becoming law, you know, but are not there yet. They're still their norms. So I agree, in, agree entirely with you that the study of social norms is fundamental, very important. I wouldn't want it to replace 
I wouldn't want a sociology of norms to replace a sociology of law because I do think law is different. Law is not the whole of yeah. norms. Law, legal legal norms are a particular kind. What is then special with law? We have to all make up our own minds as sociologists of law what our working model of law will be for, for experimental research purposes. I have my own model and I, I write all the time about what I call institutionalised doctrine. For me, what, what turns norms as such into law is the fact that those norms become create they, 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 those norms are managed within a process which includes um, agencies engaged in creating norms, interpreting norms, and enforcing norms. It doesn't have to in get involve agencies doing all of that. You know, it could be just creating norms or just enforcing them. But when you begin to see specialised agencies dealing with the norms, you're beginning to see law. So I, w I would think of law not as an all or nothing thing, like Lumen thinks of it. Uh, binary is the binary code in place or not, you know. It's not an all or nothing thing. It's a matter of degree. Think uh, norms can be more or less legal, in my view. And what's happening in a lot of transnational regulation is that regulation is sort of becoming legal by stages. You talk about a continuum. A continuum of regulation, that's league, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and at a certain point on the continuum, it begins to be seem reasonable to talk about law because you're, you're talking about something which is now authoritative. People recognise it as binding. If they have disputes, there are ways of dealing with those disputes. If, they <clears throat> if there are deviants, who are disobeying the norms, there are ways of controlling those deviants, you know. When you begin to see things like that in, in practice, you're, you're beginning to look at law. <clears throat> so, you know, to answer to your question for me is, norms are hugely important. Study of norms is at the, at the heart of sociology of law, but I wouldn't take it as the whole of sociology of law. Okay, could be helpful. Very, very helpful, yeah.